1. About three years ago, me and my father were going somewhere. Can't remember exactly where. But as we got in the car, he cursed to himself because he had forgotten something in the apartment. We take the car and stop beside the door. He runs in and I wait. Sitting in the front passenger seat with the radio mumbling on low volume, I sit there, daydreaming. I remember it was quite dark as it was a late autumn afternoon. For some reason I need some light in the car. So I flip down the sunshade, in the roof. And the little light turns on when you flip up the little mirror in it. That's when I notice it. The car is parked, so I have my father's apartment to the right of me. And about 15 meters in front of me is another row of apartments. And in one of these windows, the one on the bottom floor at the far right closest to me, is the face of a doll staring right at me. I freeze mid-motion, surprised. The window has some kind of low curtain that makes it impossible for people who walk past it to sneak a peek inside. But if you stand up on the inside, you can still look out. The doll had some kind of old white dress and it was quite big. It's blank white porcelain-like eyes staring straight at me. I lower my hands and lean back in the seat. My head tilted to the right, as if I was just daydreaming again. But in the corner of my eye, I never let the sight of the doll slip. As I sit there, I can see it starting to move. The head of it slips down behind the curtain. The room behind it is pitch black. I feel even more uneasy. It feels like it can see me through the curtain, but since it's so dark both on the inside and outside, it's unlikely. Of course, I think to myself that it's some kid having a laugh at my expense or something. But then again, there are no kids living in these apartments. I know since my father has lived there for many years. And what kid plays in a dark room like that? Whatever. Then I see it again. Slowly in the corner of my eye, the doll rises up behind the curtain, moving from side to side in a slow, pending motion. The white eyes almost gleaming in the darkness. I still sit there, never losing the doll from the corner of my eye. The mumble of the radio has all but faded, and all I can hear is my heavy breathing and now racing heart. But if you could see me, it would have looked as if I was just sitting there, with my chin in the palm of my hand, and tiredly looking out the window to the right. My father sure took his time, and that's what was starting to creep me out and stresses me out the most. I mean, surely a kid would lose interest, or at least peek up behind the curtain to see if the game had any effect on me. Nothing. As time went on, I got more and more uneasy, and it was hard not to look straight at the doll. Not that I wanted to. But whatever it was, it would not get the satisfaction of frightening me. At least it wouldn't look like it. It was excruciating to just have a bit of my vision to lock on the doll. It was still there, staring at me. After another minute or so of this torture, the doll slowly went down again, and my father came out of the apartment and got into the car. When he closed the door, the doll was gone, and there was nothing there but a dark room. My father apologized for the time. He had been gone for about ten or so minutes, but it felt much longer. Then we drove away. I never said anything. Cliché, I know. But that's how it was. I told him later, though. Every time I visit him now, I take a quick look through the window. But I never get any clues of what the hell was going on that time. I still have no idea who lived there. But it seems someone else lives there now. 2. It was a summer evening, and I was staying over at a friend's house. I'll call her Mary. Her house wasn't in the middle of nowhere, but the homes were a little spread. Her mother worked a night shift, and her older brother was in charge of watching us. Quite frankly, he didn't give a damn what we did, so long as we didn't bother him. We were about 14 years old and had already begun down the road of smoking and drinking. And on this particular night, we had neither. She and I decided to call Seth, who lived a mile or so down the road and up another, and see if he had anything or he could swipe something from his parents. He used to brag about his parents' liquor stash all the time, 
and how he and his brother would get trashed every weekend. So we didn't think it would be hard for him to share, and we could all have a good time. The phone rang a couple times, and an older man answered. We asked for our friend, and the man told us that he and his family were out of town, and he was watching the house. After Mary had been on the phone with him for a few minutes, and figured he seemed kind of... cool, and decided that since it looked like this night was going to be a bust, she may as well ask him if he had any cigarettes we could come get. He was more than obliged, and told us we were welcome to come over, and he even had some alcohol we could drink. Double score. Mary had a tendency to not think things over very well, and quickly replied that we would be on our way. She and I had a short discussion about this situation, because I felt a little uneasy. My dad had gotten to the point where he would turn the other way with me smoking because catching me and punishing me every day just became exhausting. But this was a stranger. It just seemed odd that this guy would be up for contributing to minors. She offered up a couple blades for us which made me feel a little better. And off we went. Guided by the moonlight, knives in pocket, we walked along the road to Seth's house. When we arrived, we were greeted at the front door by a slightly intoxicated man in about his late thirties or early forties, who was balding, who I will call Frank. Mary and I followed the man inside to the kitchen. We were offered up a pack of basics and a couple of Mike's Hard Lemonades. There we sat and conversed, and we learned that this Frank was a family friend, basically the uncle to Seth and his brother. I began to feel more relaxed as he filled us in on some of Seth's embarrassing childhood stories, though I'm sure the alcohol helped as well. As 2am crept around, we decided it was time for us to head home because her mom was due to be off work before long. She would sometimes leave work early, especially if one of her kids had company over. Frank seemed to keep stalling us by asking us if we wanted another drink or if we wanted to watch TV. He kept trying to tell us stories, giving us the guilt trip for wanting to leave, anything to get us to stay a little longer. Mary had already taken him up on another drink, and I was beginning to feel like this guy was just lonely and just wanted someone to hang out with. So I had another also. When we finished our drinks, we convinced him that we really did have to get going, Otherwise, we would get into deep shit for being out so late. Frank got up and walked us through the house and out the back door. By this point, I'm feeling a little inquisitive. We came in the front, so why are we standing in the backyard? He told us we could cut straight through the woods and it would dump us out where we needed to be. Now I feel like a bucket of ice water has just been dumped on me, and I sobered up real quick. Though the moon was out... The trees would cover most of that light up, and it was in the complete opposite direction. I pointed this out, and the man who had been so friendly hours before started to become annoyed and insisted that this was the way we should go. He even mentioned that if we took the road, Mary's mom might catch us out on her way home. I told him and Mary that we would just duck down behind bushes and into ditches if we saw a car coming. I grabbed Mary by the arm, thanked the guy for his generosity and hospitality, and started walking through the yard towards the front of the house to the road, while he was still trying to talk us into taking the route of the woods. Meanwhile, Mary was asking me, where are we going? We should be taking the woods so we don't get caught by mom. Drunk and concerned about getting busted, she really didn't have a chance to process the information Frank was telling us was still trying to tell us as we made our way across the road. It wasn't until we got our house down that she realized what had just almost happened. We were shaken and buzzed, and so caught up in it all that we didn't even notice the headlights until it was too late. Motherfucking 5-0 rolled up on us and busted us for curfew. Come to find out, years later, that Seth and his brother had been repeatedly molested by this creep. 
I will admit now that I'm relieved that the cop picked us up. On a lighter note, it wasn't until we got to the station that Mary remembered she had a switchblade on her, and just casually pulled it out saying to the officer, Oh yeah, I probably should have given you this when you took our smokes. I have yet to see another person turn as pale as he did in that moment. Mary also barfed, not once, not twice, but three times, on the officer's desk, before my dad came to pick me up. That officer was a trooper. 3. Throughout my life I have experienced many unusual and often unpleasant situations. For privacy reasons I don't want to give away too much information about myself. But I will say that I am a 20 year old girl, now living in Ireland, where I have lived for over 5 years. I grew up in a small Eastern European country, of which about 40% are Russian, and am of Russian descent. Even though almost everyone in my country spoke fluent Russian, and much of the population had Russian relatives, ethnic tensions in the country were high. It wasn't uncommon for you to receive a lower salary, or worse treatment in shops and other public places, if the place was run by natives. It is because of this that I believe I was singled out as a target in this particular story. That and my feeble appearance as I have always been quite short and skinny. My neighborhood, like any other, consisted of many blocks of Soviet apartments, remnants of the USSR, rotting away but nevertheless housing hundreds of people. It was a good enough neighborhood, all things considered, and I would not have called my family particularly poor. However, the building we lived in was rather bleak. The hallway was always dark, stank of piss, or sometimes other bodily excretions. The building was quite tall and had an old creaky elevator, which smelled no better than the hallway itself. Often got stuck or broke. This, however, was still more favourable than climbing the even darker sets of stairs, which often had homeless people sleeping on them, or groups of teenagers gathering to do drugs. The layout of the place is unimportant, however. I believe this description will set the scene. After a year or two of living in this building with little occurrences beside from stumbling upon the occasional stoner, with a knife trying to rob me for drug money, or a drunk passed out in front of my apartment, I started to notice two native kids hanging around the neighborhood, a girl and a boy. At first they never spoke to me, and I paid little mind to them. However, I would often notice them staring at me as I passed by, or from a distance as I played with other neighborhood kids. These kids were weird, to say the least. They spoke a limited amount of Russian and isolated themselves from everyone else, just watching me. Despite them being very similar looking, nobody knew if they were related or just two weirdos living in my building who found each other. But I remember always assuming they were brother and sister. After a while of the not-so-casual staring, they began to harass me on my walk home, tease me, push me, and generally attempt to get on my nerves with what little Russian insults they knew. I had a rather thick skin, so this didn't bother me too much. I would either completely ignore them or fight back with what I thought were rather witty comebacks. But these kids were relentless. I began to wonder why they decided to randomly pick on me, as I had never said a word to them before and had never really paid them any significant amount of attention. But they decided to settle for the, they're just a bit weird, explanation. Nevertheless, this is all just teasing, right? Kids being kids. One day on my walk home, the strange duo were on my heels as usual. The boy making some crude comments about my nationality, and how I should go back home to Russia, as well as other unrelated insults, while the girl snorted and laughed her ass off. I did my best to ignore their behaviour, not feeling in the mood to dignify them with a clever comeback this time. However, it became increasingly difficult, as in frustration the two suddenly became more aggressive than usual. All the other times this went on they would just give up and leave me alone after a while, walking in the other direction. But this time, to my surprise, they followed me into my building and into the poorly lit stinky hallway. 
Still ignoring them, I pressed the button for the elevator, when I felt the boy roughly grab me from behind. I was in shock. The girl joined him, bending my arm in an incredibly uncomfortable position behind my back. What the hell are you doing? I screamed at them. As they began attempting to drag me to the almost back staircase, telling me to shut the fuck up. I struggled, of course, not understanding what had gotten into these two. I mean, I knew they were weird, but this was something else. This didn't feel like childhood bullies or kids being kids. I believe these two had something sinister on their minds. As I struggled against their grip, trying to break my way free and towards the elevator that now arrived onto the ground floor, a middle-aged woman walked into the hallway, a look of confusion at the sight before her on her face. She asked, Is anyone going up? Desperately, I breathed, I am, please. Reaching the elevator, only to hear the guy snarl, You're not going anywhere. To my surprise, despite the pure desperation in my voice, and the fact that I was fighting two seemingly older kids, due to my size, trying to drag me away, the women didn't offer any help. Didn't give out to the two kids, didn't even ask what the heck was going on. Just shrugged her shoulders and walked into the elevator. What was going through her head still makes me curious, but I'm assuming this was probably due to assuming this was nothing serious because of our age. Or maybe her not wanting to get involved any more than she already had in order to avoid trouble. After all, our neighborhood isn't the safest, and it's best to just stay out of trouble if you can. At this point, I became surged with adrenaline. Partly from my desire to get into that elevator and away from these two, and partly from my anger at her refusal to help me. It's amazing what the human body can do when faced with a potentially dangerous situation. Using all of my strength, I whipped around and slammed the boy harshly into the wall behind me, immediately making both the girl and the boy let go of me. I could tell that the two of them were as shocked as I was at what I had just done. As I said, I was a small girl, but it felt as though someone else had possessed me at that moment, as if I wasn't even in control of my actions. All I knew was that I had to get away. As soon as I was let go, I ran to the elevator and managed to make it inside before the door closed. The last thing I remember seeing before the door slammed shut and we took off was the girl's shocked expression as she stared at me, surprised of what I was capable of. The lady in the elevator didn't say a word to me. I wish I could say it ended there. A few days later, I was confident in my ability to defend myself against those two, and was pretty sure they would not attempt to attack me again, or even go near me. My relief, however, was short-lived. A friend of mine knocked on my door at the usual time I would go out on a free day, asking me to hang out. I, of course, excitedly agreed, and as soon as I was ready, we headed out and through the elevator. As previously mentioned, the elevator itself was not all that sturdy and easily broke down. But that's not the only thing that made it extremely unsafe. If you were a child and were taking the elevator alone, especially in a building as tall as ours where there were many floors, you never knew what the person that got on with you turned out to be, and what they could do to you especially if the elevator suddenly got stuck. This wasn't something that happened so often, of course, that it prevented us from using it, and taking the dreaded stairs. We got on without a worry in the world, and pressed the button for the ground floor, and began chatting about nothing in particular. About four floors down, the elevator stopped, letting on a burly middle-aged man. Just the sight of him was intimidating. He had a sunken face, long black greasy hair, a curly beard, sweat stains under his arms, and his belly was so big it took up most of the room in the tiny elevator, pushing my friend and I into a corner. We fell silent. At first he said nothing, just stared at the two of us as the elevator doors closed. I could tell that much like myself, my friend had an uneasy feeling about him and what his intentions with us were. Then in a deep, hoarse voice, he says slowly and calmly, You think you're tough, don't you? It was more of a statement than a question, and I could tell it was directed at me. Suddenly he pressed the elevator stop button, screeching it to a halt. 
reached out and grabbed me by the fringe. He pinned me against the wall of the elevator, still holding onto my fringe, and began to pull up. I could see some strands of my hair ripping out of my skull as I was being lifted slowly. However, not enough for my feet to lose contact with the ground. I squealed in pain as my friend watched in shock, cowering further into the corner, unable to do anything. I can be tough too, he sneered, in a slightly sarcastic tone. I began to try and make him let go of my hair, but to no avail. The more I moved, the more of my fringe ripped out, and the more painful it became so. I just stopped struggling and attempted to stand up on my tippy toes as much as I could, to release the tension he put on my hair. You think it's so funny to hurt my son? For a second I had no idea what he was on about. Then I realized, the boy I had slammed against the wall in an attempt to get away. He must have told his parents what happened, most likely neglecting to include the fact that he attacked me first. Or maybe he did, and his father just didn't give a shit. He didn't seem like a very reasonable man at all. I know what floor you live on. If you ever touch my son again, I will put a knife through your throat in this fucking elevator. Do you understand me? He hissed at me. Before I could respond, the elevator began to move again. Someone must have called it on another floor. He narrowed his eyes at me and let go of my hair, standing back and acting as if nothing happened. As we stopped, and another person got on a few floors down. The rest of the ride was spent in silence. I don't know what was scarier, the fact that this clearly insane man was threatening my life, or the fact that his equally loopy son stopped me without my knowledge to find out what floor I lived on, and what my routine was just so he could get his psycho dad to threaten me. And for what? My friend and I tried not to speak about it again, but whenever I saw those two kids again, they just kept their distance, as they have before, grinning at me. Hey everyone, Hell Freezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Three True Scary Stories, episode 204. Thanks very much to everyone who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Okay, if all went well over the weekend, I should currently have a Patreon up and running. I'll start to include the links in the, the usual information on the videos. I'll also add it to my end card. And uh, I'll try not to pimp it out too much, but it is there for anyone who would like to become a patron. Patron? 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 Well, however it's pronounced, if you'd like to do that, then the option will be there. I will, of course, be uploading Patreon-only uh, exclusives. I'll, I'll do, do stories, short stories, things and that here and there. And uh, I'll maybe, if anyone wants it, what I can also start doing is I upload for Patreon subscribers. I can upload the audio only of the of the videos for those who want them. And that's definitely not a problem at all to do. And I'll make that available because I know a lot of folks perhaps like to listen when they're out and about. So it would save those of you who uh, who have access. It would save you a job having to rip the audio and download the videos. Anyway, I'm not going to go on about it too much. I just wanted to let you know that I was doing it and to explain why I'm doing it. And the reason for that is because of the way things are with the ad situation on YouTube right now. We YouTubers that do this full time, those of us who do it as a job, we're pretty much doing the same work. Uh, and imagine, imagine doing it yourself if you went into your work and you were told you're going to have to do the same job, same workload, but you're going to get paid on a good day about a third of what you were making. And on a bad day, it's even worse. So I'm setting this up in the hopes that it will get us through the lean period and YouTube will fix the situation with the um, the issues with ads. Because what's happening, I looked through some of my own videos as well and I noticed this was happening. Uh, a lot of them are, a lot of them will, will have ads on them that, where the adverts should be. And many people uh, are finding, myself included, that some videos just randomly don't have ads on them, even though they're enabled. And if you check, if you want your, your settings and you check where the ads are placed and everything, everything will be there. It's just what, what YouTube's doing right now to try and fix the problem. And we understand, we do understand there is a problem and you are trying to fix it. So we're sympathetic to that. But what they're doing right now in trying to fix the problem is also causing the error of ads not showing up on some videos where they should be. So hopefully that is another thing they will fix and address soon. Uh, but yeah. Uh, Patreon should be live now. If it's not live today, it will be by, I'm going to say Monday. 
just, uh, yeah, let's say Monday at the absolute latest. Okay, and with that, I'm going to shut up for now. Thank you very much for putting up with me whinging about this, and I'm going to head off. So thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.